Good morning. Okay, we're back in Hebrews, this great epistle as we journey through it and study it together. We'll be in chapter 11 again. Lord willing, we'll finish the chapter today. Let's go to the Lord. Father, we are so grateful that you love us. What a truth, what a reality to lay hold of and be blessed by is that God loves us. You've given us your word. You've given us your son. You've given us such good news. You've given us warnings. You give us hope. You give us encouragement. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from you, and we thank you this morning. I ask you to help me to teach the truth in love, to have grace, gifting even, to, to teach what you have to teach, and I pray you'd speak to your people. We love you and look to you now in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 32, through the end of the chapter. It says, And what more shall I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put up foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains, and in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had promised something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Amen. What a passage. The challenge for me wasn't what to say, it's what to leave out. <laughs> In these, this, this particular study especially, it's so rich, it's so full, that hopefully I can capture the essence of what the author is saying for us today and what the Lord's saying and as we remember, the, the author of the Hebrews spent a lot of time up to this point drawing out the importance of faith. That's the theme of chapter 11, faith. And he wrote of the full assurance of faith in chapter 10, right before that. He's talking about this full assurance of faith and how he who promised is faithful. And that ought to draw out our faith. And he quoted that pillar biblical truth, that text from Habakkuk, which most of them probably knew. This, this statement from Habakkuk, which he quotes in 10, 37 and 38, saying, For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. That's a truth for them. The pre-Christian era, it was always, he's coming. He's coming, this promised one. And he's going to come. And he says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. So for some, it's a, forward, it's a forward-looking, waiting faith for the coming one. For us today, after the cross, we're remembering. And we have these, these great truths and promises and the light that comes. And he says, my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. This is God speaking. He does not like shrinking back in unbelief or in fear. So, he proceeds to define faith in, in chapter 11, verse 1, which he says it's the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, or you could say the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, that not seen element is what faith lays hold of, the unseen realities. 
And these unseen realities are actually the ones that really matter the most in life. That's what the scriptures, that's what the Lord's telling us. The things you don't see that are real. Christ in heaven, the high priest in the inner sanctuary today is unseen, but he's real. The truths of God are unseen in the physical senses. All that you see with the physical eyes, the physical things, the scriptures say are temporal. They're fleeting, they're passing away. He says, but the unseen things are what? Eternal. And this is why faith's so important. It lays hold of the unseen. So he follows this definition with this list of people. And he starts with Abel, a son of Adam. And he goes all the way through to, to Rahab, all through this point, right up into the point where the Israelites enter into the promised land, the land of Canaan. He goes through these lists, and he talks about these people, how they're examples for us today. They are not some superheroes that you can't be like. They were people just like us. And they are examples for us, and he's using them as examples for us, for us to learn by, be motivated by, and for our faith to be built up. So that's what he's doing here. And then he moves into verse 32, and he says, what more shall I say? Kind of like Isaiah, what else can be said that needs to be said? That's how God speaks. What more shall I say? Time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and the prophets. See, what I think he's doing is, is he doesn't want to get tedious or laborious to repeat the same realities about faith. In other words, I could go on and on and on talking about these other people, these other biblical characters. So he's drawing a close now to this important theme. He's, he's drawing a close of this theme of salvation being by faith and faith alone and how God commends that. And that's the way it's always been and it's the way it will always be. Faith and faith alone. So the author's either, in one sense, out of time. I, time would fail me. You know, some preachers can get up and go on and on and on and on and on and on on one little thing. So there is that aspect. He doesn't want to do that. Or he could really be out of time. Like, I, I'm just out of time on this. I need, to, I need to wrap this letter up. And he doesn't want to belabor the point, so he's transitioning now to the application. So what we're going to get... We're moving into application. All this theology about Christ, the priestly ministry of Christ, his preeminence, where he is, all the blood, all the, the redemption, his saving power. Faith is the key. And now we're going to apply. You know, it's, it's a, this, this is a brilliant man on a human level as a communicator. Yes, he's inspired by the Holy Spirit, yet he's also showing his communication power. <laughs> he is a brilliant communicator. It's a very effective form of communication for this audible listening audience. That's the way he wrote the letter. It's like a sermon to be heard. We've talked about that before, but look what he's doing. It's, it's really a literary technique where he's not wanting to go into all these other examples, so he says he's not going to, but in a subtle way, he actually does. He gets you, he gets you thinking about it about these people and how their lives reflect exactly what he's been talking about. And at a quick glance, I mean, if you look at the list of names, especially some that he's just brought up, you may scratch your head and, and recognize, man, wait a minute, these people, some of them had some serious character flaws or even really grievous sin. Why them? Why, why is he drawing out them? But this is the case. Isn't this the fact and reality with all of us? We've all got grievous sin. We've all, we all have character flaws. And this is a significant part of what makes the gospel such good news, isn't it? Even they, though they have some flaws, faith still shines through. And God sees it. And he commends it. And that's what pleases him. It's amazing if you look at people's lives all through the scripture, even people that have been converted, what God can overlook. 
when saving faith is in action in him, what he will let go, what he will forgive and dismiss. So this author, he's very pastoral too. He's, he's working hard to help this struggling church. And he gave those warnings. You cannot grow dull of hearing. You can't phase out. You can't get lazy about this. You cannot drift. That's what he's trying to prevent. Drifting. It's a danger for every human being on the planet. Drifting away. And it doesn't all happen like that, like all of a sudden. It's, it's, it's one of those things. You're, you're being out in a boat. You may, you may be fishing or doing something, and you don't have an anchor or anything. And you look up, and you think, whoa, how did I get out here? That's how drifting works until you're gone. You, you cannot neglect such a great salvation. You've got to pay much closer attention to what you've heard. He's trying to help them. So my approach today is to try and do what the author's doing in the flow of his message here and help us to see basically a few fundamental things. Number one is these triumphs, the triumphs of faith. Look at these victories. Look at these accomplishments and achievements. And another thing, a second thing, is that we're going to acknowledge the suffering may be faced. There may be suffering. Suffering's included. And we'll finish with this, this third aspect of that we too can both achieve great things and suffer, but we can do it even better in a way because we have something better provided for us, as he said in 39 and 40. So as a whole, he's showing in this that, that what faith can do and what faith can endure. So look at verses 33 to 35, the very beginning of, or the middle, first half of 35. He says, Who through faith, and there's the key again, by faith, through faith, conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, attained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead by resurrection. So we'll pause there. See, these, these are not directly corresponding one-to-one, -one, like with the people he just listed. He's, he's kind of just throwing them out there. Even the people he listed aren't in chronological, biblical order, if you're paying close attention. Like Barak came before Gideon, David came after Samuel. So these are general summaries of the power of faith at work in weak and ordinary people. People who are simply believing God, trusting God, trusting His power, trusting in His sovereignty, trusting Him to do what He promised He'd do. That's what they're doing. These are what they're showing us. So conquering kingdoms. That's a big one, right? Conquering kingdoms really happened by faith. Now you may think, well, people do that. Pagan nations do that. They get a zealous enough leader. They get a powerful enough army and battle plan and the right weapons. They can conquer kingdoms. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking about the powerful leadership, the good weapons, the vast armies, all this stuff. He's talking about something that happened by faith. In a way, we could say those few fishermen and tax collector and political zealot, those, those guys conquered the Roman Empire. Isn't that what happened in due time? Did they do it with weapons? They did it by faith. But this happened before Christ. This happened. Things happened by faith. So if you consider Gideon for a few minutes, Gideon, what a story. You know, he, he's out here, he's, he's going about his, his life, and God approaches him, wants him to go up against the Midianite kingdom. And he gathers the army, he's got a pretty sizable group, but God says, no, you've got way too many. That's too many for me to get the glory in this battle. And isn't that quite a, quite a truth? 
So he riddles them down. If some are scared, tell them they can go home. And a big portion of them went home. And then he, he kept going where he said, have them drink in this brook. And the ones that drink a certain way, have them go home. And what he's left with is 300 men. 300 men. Now, you might be able to fit, yeah, you could fit 300 grown men in this room, probably tight, tightly. The Midianite army had upwards of 120,000 men. Now, <clears throat> I don't watch a lot of sports. I, I have in the past, but some of those, some of those like, college football stadiums, hold, I think, max capacity, 110. Some, do they reach 120,000? I don't know. I'm trying to give us the picture. A massive stadium packed full of people and then a, a group in this room. This is, this is how God's going to do it. And you don't need swords. You don't need bow and arrows. You don't need all that. What you need to take is clay pots, a torch, and trumpets. You've got to be thinking, now what's this doing? What's this requiring of Gideon? Faith. I'm going to have to trust God. And that's what he did. So they had their, their, their torches. They divide out in three, three areas around the army. They have their clay pots they shatter and they blow their trumpets. And what happens? God turns the army in on itself. In panic and in fear, the army starts destroying itself. See, God's ways are past finding out. Gideon wasn't expecting that. But it happened. And he operated in faith. He trusted God. So God can do any of that. You may think, we have unconquerable enemies out there against Christianity or whatever. They just, they're too strong. Or they're too many. Or they're too influential. Or they have too much money. Whatever. God's ways are past finding out, and he can be trusted. That's what we're seeing in, in a lot of these things. The fundamental biblical truth, you can find it in Exodus 14.14, 14, Isaiah 64.4, 4, God fights for those who wait upon him, who trust him. He's the fighter. And that's where Paul can say things like, if God's for you, who can be against you? That's the fundamental truth. Faith lays hold of that. Faith thrives in that, in that truth. Samson, you know, he, was, he wasn't afraid to throw himself into a battle with nothing, <laughs> no weapons. He'd throw himself into a thousand men. He'd pick up the first thing he saw, which, which the story tells us one time, he picked up what? The jawbone of a donkey and took out an army. Now, this guy, he wasn't some big Herculean muscle man, 12 feet tall, right, bounding biceps. No, he probably looked like Alan or C.W., just like this like normal guy. He went and he did it. He did it by the power of God. He simply did not fear to throw himself into a fight. Alan's not either, is he? We got to hold that guy back. It's like holding the horse by the reins all the time. He's ready to go. That, but faith, see, he, he's ready to jump into the fight. I'll do it because God's name and God told me to. And these are God's enemies. I'll jump in. I'll just dive in. That's how he, that's how he lived. And really, yes, he had flaws, sins, thinking, what are you doing? That's foolish. But he would jump in. And he, it was really childlike faith. That's why his name shows up in Hebrews 11. Jephthah, I mean, he was a son of a prostitute. His dad was, was Gilead. Well-recognized well name, right? His dad was Gilead. But, you know, Gilead's wife had other sons, and they did not like this fact of Jephthah being this illegitimate son, son of sin and all that. And so... He's kind of cast out by them, but he was, a, he was a mighty warrior as well. And he knew Israel's history. I mean, you watch his account of how he's, he's, he's saying to these enemy people, like, wait, those are not your boundaries. History shows these are our boundaries. He was explained elaborately. This isn't, this isn't the law. This isn't right. This isn't legal. This isn't true. These, 
God's given us this. Well, he's ready to fight. He's ready to go up against the fiercest armies on earth to defend God's name, God's territory, God's purposes, to fight for the Lord, in other words. And yes, he makes a rash vow. Right, That might be another study for another time. Basically saying, whatever comes out of my door, Lord, if you'll give me the victory, whatever comes out of my door when I get home, I'll offer up to you as a burnt offering. Now that's, that's what we would call a rash vow. You, you don't bargain with God like that. But in a way, what's that really showing us? You really, why would you say something like that? One thing it tells you is his radical devotion to God. I will hold nothing back to God. Well, he won the battles. God gave him victories. Now, David's probably the brightest shining light among all of them. He just, he's throughout the scriptures highly esteemed and honored, even by God. A man after my own heart. Yes, he had flaws too, didn't he? He had a grievous sin and sins. But he walked in faith. One of the most noteworthy is when he was a, a, a teenage boy, right? And he goes to check on his brothers. This big battle's going to happen with the Philistines, and they send out their giant, their, their Goliath. Now, this was the nine-foot-tall, muscle-bound warrior with his army and swords and spears who's probably never lost a fight in his life, right? From a kid, he was probably whooping bigger boys. Now he's this champion warrior, and David, he's not afraid. Fear is cast out. Remember, that's how faith, faith casts out fear. He's not afraid to go up against him. Why? Because they're blaspheming the name of the Lord. The, Lord of our, the, the Lord's armies. So I'll do it. I'll go. And so he goes. Slinging a stone. We know the rest of the story. But this is by faith. And these, these people mentioned here in this section, if you start looking at it closely, they're really all various kinds of David and Goliath stories. God's showing us things. One man against an army with no weapons. A small band of nobodies against a modernized, mechanized army with sophisticated weapons and brilliant military leaders. And by faith, they win. They conquer. It happened over and over. God proves that He is faithful and that He is mighty. That's what He's showing us through the Scriptures. He said, through faith, they, another thing, another little element here, they stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire. Now, this is, this is hearkening back to who? Daniel. I mean, there were other lion encounters, like David did. He, he, he took out lions that were trying to get the sheep. Samson had a lion event. There's another judge, like Benaiah or something like that. He, he killed a lion in this pit, Some, but this is, this is a little different. It says, by faith they stopped the mouths of lions. And I think it's clearly talking about Daniel during that exile to Babylon when he was thrown into this den of lions because they had made some law of the land of the Medes and Persians that you can't pray to any, anyone but their God, their idols, but Daniel refused that. He prayed. He even did it with his windows open. He did not submit to that. And he knew that the penalty was being thrown into the lions, which was really what? It was the death sentence. You don't get thrown into this den of lions and come out alive. You don't come out at all. Right? You're lion food. You're, you're, you're gone. Well, Rather than shrinking back in fear, he feared the Lord, and he lived by faith, and he was thrown into this den of lions. And the story tells us God sent an angel and, and stopped the mouths. That's what he said. God protected me. He stopped their mouths. So this is God moving upon the nature of these wild beasts and 
stopping the power of these lions, which is in their mouths. That's how they kill and devour. He can stop the power of things. That's the big idea. And then that naturally triggered the author's mind to think about his three friends, Shadrach, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, thrown into the fiery furnace, right? Because they, it was the same thing. They would not bow the knee. They would not worship the false gods. They only worshiped the Lord. And the fire they were thrown into, this, this blazing furnace, they heated up seven times. Not a single hair on their bodies was burned. And we know it was really hot because the Babylonian guards who had to throw them in, they died in the process. It's like they, they had to give their own life. They had to die just to get those guys into the furnace, and they, however that worked. So it was hot. It was real fire. And God stopped it. They didn't get burned. Faith in their situation didn't even say, hey, you got a promise God will keep you from getting burned. They didn't have that, did they? They didn't even live with that kind of understanding. They said, all we know is God is the Lord. He is sovereign and mighty. If he wants to deliver us, he can deliver us. We don't know if he will or won't. But one thing they know, they knew that their duty before the Lord was to be faithful, even unto death, if that's what it meant. One, only true faith can, can what, work this in us. Real faith. I'm not saying great faith. I'm just saying real faith in a great God. That's what happened. The story tells us God can remove the power of things, even the power of fire, from burning these men. He can stop or overcome the nature of things, these lions and fire. Now, that's incredible. That, you talk about real power and authority over the nature of fire to not burn you. He can do it. And he's shown that he can and does, he has done it. So he can stop or remove the power of anything. We see this going on in the book of Hebrews. This is part of the thread. Deadly and threatening things like sin, Far more dangerous than that flaming furnace, sin, or the lions. Sin is the great danger, sin. He can stop the dominion of sin in our lives. And he can remove its stain from our souls. He can remove the sting and power of death. Or the fear of death. That's what he said in chapter 2. He's liberated us by conquering him who had the power of death. And so he eliminates that. So what we're seeing, too, is faith is a victory over all causes of not following and trusting Christ all the way to the end. Faith. So there's nothing, nothing with which you're concerned in life that faith will not be a help for you. It will, and you need to walk in faith. There's simply nothing too difficult for true faith. I hope that's what we're seeing in all these things. Nothing too difficult for true faith. Because we can start believing the lie, this this is impossible. This, This situation is too hard, or whatever. But faith is saying it's not too hard. And that's what God's saying to us. It's like it's like Joshua and Caleb. They were wanting to take the land. But no one else did. But all they knew is God's with us. So it's not too hard. If God's promised it, if it's his work, nothing can stop it. You know, it it may even seem at some point like it's you against the world. Remember Athanasius, that name? One of the early patristic fathers in AD 356. He, he was really standing alone because the world was pervaded with heresy. They were believing the Arian heresy. And it was even what we, what we might think is kind of a small thing. It's not. It was not a small thing. If you're not understanding the gospel and who Christ is. He was ready to stand against the world. The phrase 
Athanasius contra mundum, Athanasius against the world. And he would be telling us, therefore, considering that this struggle is for our all, we're contending for our all. And that the choice is now before us either to deny or preserve the faith. That's what you're going to make a choice about. You're going to deny or preserve the faith. Let us also make it our earnest care and aim to guard what we have received. That's what Athanasius will be preaching today. And that's the truth, isn't it? See, these are a few examples of the triumph of faith, the hand of God at work in people who simply loved and trusted Him. For those who did not shrink back in fear, like chapter 10 said not to do. But in faith, they believed God. Not in, they did not fall into unbelief. They believed, and God brought the victories. So now the second part here, we're going to talk about this suffering by faith. Look at the, look at the difference. What we're going to see now is that the attacks from the world cannot conquer faith. So in one sense, we saw faith going after it, right? Right? doing the attacking, doing the conquering, doing the kingdom taking, taking by weakness, rising up in strength. And now we're going to see faith almost like a shield. It's going to protect you from everything the enemy's got to bring at you. Middle of verse 35, he ends that first statement with a sentence. Some, he said, women receive back their dead by resurrection, period. Now there's a shift. Right here. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. See, faith is unconquerable. Why? Because it lays hold of, it's united to one who is indestructible and unconquerable. Remember what Hebrews 7 said about our, our Lord? It said, who, he, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. Show me your credentials. Those are his credentials. He has a spotless, sinless life, and he has the power of an indestructible life. Your faith in him makes your faith indestructible. Quite a, quite a truth, isn't it? So God speaking through this author to the Hebrews, this is how the Lord is. He's honest about this. He's not going to sugarcoat things. The Lord Jesus didn't. He would say, you're going to have to take up your cross. You're going to have to count the cost, things like that. God's not sugarcoating anything. There are hard realities that many have and will have to face in life because of faith, faith in Him. So what we're seeing is some conquer and some suffer. And some blend to both, right? Right? In every life. It's part of the cost to follow Christ. See, they were tortured. Now, that's torture. There are countless ways to torture a human being. It's the inhumane pain inflicted on someone to get them to do things your way or see things your way or, or surrender or whatever. I won't even get into some of the forms of torture. I don't want to distract our minds. They're awful. But some were tortured, he tells us here. And the thing is, he says also, they could have been released. They didn't have to be tortured. They, if they would just surrender, bow, bow, stop, deny, whatever, all that. You don't have to go through this pain, this torture, whatever it is. But they didn't. True faith won't do it. Faith wouldn't do it. Why? Because it says here, they had hope in a better life to come. 
That right there, that is the heart of this epistle to the Hebrews, this better life, this better city, right? This pilgrimage to this city whose builder and maker is God. Faith says, don't accept release. That's what faith says, don't accept release. Go through with it. God is with you. You have a future hope. You have a future life. Remember the Lord. Don't shrink back. That's what faith preaches, right? That's what faith says. And that's what faith even enables. It brings with it the power of God into your life. You hear these martyr stories. It's like they're afraid. They've got no light. But they know they're not going to deny the Lord. And when it comes to the moment... It's like when they see the stake and they see the flames, it's like, it almost looks like, throw me in it. I'm ready. Like the Lord gives grace and enablement. So some people conquered and received back their dead by resurrection, it tells us. Probably like Elijah and Elisha, the, the, women, the women getting their children back. He says other people suffered because they had hoped that they might rise again to a better life. This literally says that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now, those resurrections were awesome. The parents getting back their child, what a joy, what a a wonderful thing. Lazarus from the tomb, the widow of Nain, but those people are still going to die, so we're talking about now a better resurrection. That's noteworthy. Not temporary like those others. Right? What he's saying is a better and final glorious resurrection with life for eternal to Christ, with Christ forever. That's what they're going to obtain. That's why they can go through the suffering or the torture or whatever it is. Now, this whole notion of resurrection is what <clears throat> Owen calls the top stone of true religion. This truth of resurrection. This truth faith lays hold of, and especially in the prison or under the threat of dying for your faith, this truth of the resurrection is what gets you through and will get you through. We need to remember that. The Apostle Paul said, We are of all men most miserable if there is no resurrection. Like This is what it's all about. The resurrection of the dead, to live with Christ. If you look at Philippians 3, verses 8 through 11, if you want to turn there or listen, listen to the Apostle Paul and think about what we've just been talking about. Listen to Paul, put it into words. He says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things. And count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. Samson and Gideon, they're all saying, praise the Lord for that. But that which comes through faith in Christ. Well, we're all saying, praise the Lord for that. The righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of his resurrection. So this isn't just any old resurrection. It's the same one that he experienced, you will experience. That life, eternal, and glorification. It's his resurrection you're going to share in. It's incredible. And may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. These truths Paul lived out, didn't he? He suffered. You would look at what he said in 2 Corinthians 11, the things he went through. Oh, my. But he could do it by faith and faith alone. So people suffered mocking. No one likes to be mocked. But faith will let it just roll off your back. Floggings, chains, imprisonment, all through faith. Faith in God upheld them and enabled them to have power to endure it. 
They were stoned, probably for blasphemy, right? That was the penalty. You're believing Jesus Christ is who? That's blasphemy. People were stoned for it, killed by the pummeling of boulders and rocks. They were sawn in two. Now, what? Did you notice that one? Sawn in two, like with a saw? Yeah. And according to Jewish tradition, and even the early patristic writers like Justin Martyr, Tertullian, Origen, Hippolytus, Jer- Jerome, they all thought that this was the fate of the prophet Isaiah. Do you know that? It's how Isaiah died, most likely. Something about being uh, placed in this log, the hollow, hollow of a log, and they sawed it in two. So what is this? What is going on? What is, what's the picture in all this? What it shows is the fierce hatred of the world, an unbelieving world. It's what it shows. It ruthlessly hunts and attacks those who trust in the Lord and in His promises. It's a guilty hostility against the truth. And it's trying to do everything it can. It's like all hell throwing everything it has at the children of God. It will do it. It'll be subtle, and then there will be just overt, I'm going to throw it all. One person said, rejecting the world, they were ejected by the world. The faithful have had to live in caves and mountains and dens wearing poor clothing, all by faith. And the sad irony is that these are people of whom the, the Lord says are, the world is not worthy of them. Not one of them. Isn't that, isn't that incredible how he views it? Although they were deprived, oppressed, robbed of everything, one single individual person among the faithful is worth more to God than the whole world. The world of unbelief, right? And the evil world system. One. Just one of you. That's, that's, that ought to help us, encourage us, and build our faith. This is how God views them, and us. They will be those who inherit the world. Jesus says the meek shall inherit the earth. And this message is certain. The world will never, ever have victory over the church. Ever. It's quite the opposite. So if the wicked rulers of the world drive God's faithful people into the wilderness, then guess where God's going to preserve them and where he's going to preserve his truth and the gospel. It'll be there. Well, I'm out of time. You don't get point three today. I feel like I should stop because it's too good and important. Verses 39 to 40, you'll have to wait. So in two weeks, I'll I'll address that topic Though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. All these, these pre-Christian people. Since God has provided something better for us. That apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Amen. Father, bless this word to your people. We love you and pray, Lord, that we can lay hold of these truths by your Holy Spirit. and Be built up in the faith, for you are worthy. Thank you for those who've gone before us as living examples, precious, faithful ones. We look to you now in Jesus' precious name. Amen.